Where are we going? First Thessalonians chapter two. Listen to. It's nice to have some humor once in a while. You should laugh with people, not at people. That's rude. All right. We started First Thessalonians last uh, last Wednesday, and we did the whole chapter. We'll just do ten verses of chapter two. And First um, Thessalonians. It's supposed to be the first letter that Paul wrote uh, in his writings. And so, lesson number one, we started there with an introduction in verse one. And then, uh, introduction one, then we talked about his appreciation for these people. In verse two, secondly, last week. And then uh, the third thing we saw in verse three was they're remembering or reminiscing over uh, the past and working with these folks. And uh, then number four, we talked about the plan of salvation and assurance of salvation. In uh, verse four and five, we went into some other verses on assurance of salvation. And then we talked about duplication, number five, last week, verse six to seven, because they are now following Paul and duplicating the apostles in, in their salvation. And then number six last week we talked in verse number eight, A, evangelization, how the word of God sounded out. And remember it said uh, that the word echo, and they echoed what the apostles had taught them. In, in uh, doctrinal safety there, that they should all speak the same thing and all have the same mind. And then we saw number, number uh, seven, multiplication, because now we see he's talking about the third generation, so the apostles, the Thessalonians, and now they're reaching out into a third generation of people being saved, called multiplication. And so you don't want division and you don't want subtraction, but you want addition and multiplication. And that's what you see in the spread of the gospel is addition and added to the church daily said you should be saved. And they said the great multitudes and multiplied uh, in the book of Acts. And then we close out with number eight in uh, verse nine B and verse 10, anticipation that we're to wait uh, for the Lord and his return and serve while we're waiting, being busy and tearing in the master's work. So that was chapter one. And now tonight, we pick up in chapter two, verse one to 10. And so Lord, we ask you now to guide us in these 10 verses. It's a lot packed in here. And uh, we thank you for the apostle Paul's salvation and Thessalonians salvation and all of that contributed to our salvation. So help us to remember that just one lost soul come to Christ. Many, many can be saved through the hundreds of years to come at whatever time we go on this earth. So we pray now that you would uh, in, <clears throat> strengthen us and edify us with thy word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to see here in chapter 2. So we see three things here in the next few minutes. In verse 1 to 3, we see Paul's entrance. He talks about when he first met them, and he had an entrance into their life that God worked out for them. Paul's entrance uh, here says in verse 1 to 3, For yourselves, brethren, know that, know what? Our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. So let's go back in verse one. We see he says the uh, entrance 
was not in vain. So uh, <clears throat> he didn't waste his time. He's telling them, you know, I'm thankful when we came to you, we weren't wasting our time because he said our entrance into you was not in vain. And then 2A, he says uh, the entrance was not in vain, but also they entered after they had suffered great persecution after suffering conflict in verse 2 but even after we had suffered before even before we met them they went through terrible sufferings and were shamefully entreated as you know in Philippi so they uh, he said well, we had an interest it was not in vain it was not a waste of our time or yours and after suffering conflict because the uh, end of Verse 2 is the word contention, with much contention, which means conflict. They, they weren't fighting among themselves. It was, this word also is a word for conflict from, a, from outside sources. The devil trying to keep them away from these Thessalonian believers. And then we see in uh, 2b here, boldness. We came in an entrance of boldness, and we were bold in our God speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. So it wasn't in vain. It was after they had finished their suffering and, and conflict. It came in boldness. Verse 3 says something else in their entrance. It says, For our exhortation, which is uh, their exhorting, which means challenging and, and uh, teaching, for our exhortation was not of what? was not of deceit. So he said, we didn't come uh, here uh, deceitful, telling lies, making up stuff, and fairy tales, and all kinds of uh, mythological things like Zeus and Jupiter and stuff. For exhortation was also, the entrance here of exhortation was not of deceit. Uh, so we, we have, uh, he says, it's not of lies. We didn't come to, to try to trick you. And then secondly, nor of what else? Uncleanness. We didn't bring in an, an immoral message. Something that uh, that you could get by with immorally. We, we brought you the moral gospel of Christ. Not nor of uncleanness. And so then lastly he says, nor, 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 say, and, uh, nor in guile. Now guile is being cunning or sly. You know, the sleight of hand like a, a, a huckster, you know, a con man or something like that. And so we didn't come with lies and we didn't, we didn't come with immorality and we did not make an entrance through cunningness or being sly, taking advantage of people. So that's Paul's entrance in verses 1 to 3. So he tells us how they came and how they got started and what their message was. Now... Secondly, Paul's allowance, not only his entrance, but now we pick up in verse 4 to 6, we see his allowance. And verse 4 says, but as we were, what does he use here? Allowed. Okay, this is a permission here. It's not uh, 25 cents a week allowance from your mom and dad. How many got allowances when you were a kid? No. I did until... Dad drank it all up. <laughs> I swallowed my allowance one week. That's another story, by the way. But I, it was 56 cents. I remember it uh, perfectly. It was such a horrible event. But he says the allowance is what we had permission to do. So they had an entrance into the fellowship of these people. But as we were allowed of God, to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak. Not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, but, <clears throat> excuse me, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles Christ. So what he's saying is he uh, he was allowed 
You know why I'm up here? Because I've been allowed to do this. Allowed by the church 36 years ago almost. Said we'd like to allow you to, to speak and teach us. This, the call of God, I wrote something many years ago. Turn to Acts 13, verse 1. So he says God has to allow this. We must understand that teaching and preaching the word of God, pastoring, missionary work, evangelist work, uh, it is a calling, it is not a choosing. Preaching the gospel has to be allowed. The Bible calls it granted. Paul uses that often. God granted, God granted, God granted. It is a calling and not a choosing. It is a sending and not a going. Because in this college town of preachers' colleges uh, for all these 60 years in this area, people just get something in their head. They think, I'll just try that. I think I'll go and do that. I think, uh, I don't need permission. I don't need, uh, I don't need a sending church. I don't need, I just, I'm, I just, I'm going to do it. Well, that's how your cults get started, by the way. Judge Russell, Mary Baker Eddy, cult leaders of Jehovah's Witnesses and, and Christian scientists, and Mary, uh, what's the other one? Seventh-day Adventist, Ellen G. White, the White family started that. All of that, that's what you have when you are not uh, properly following the scriptures. So it says here in Acts 13, actually starts in uh, verse, uh, excuse me, chapter 12, but I forgot to write that down. And, uh, uh, we'll find that later. But anyway, Barnabas was sent by the church of Jerusalem and, uh, in chapter 12, but we pick up in 13, now we have the, the church that has been established, uh, and now it is an ascending church of Paul and, and Barnabas, and it says here, now there we're in the church. It's not talking about a, a universal church because there's only one doctrine on the earth at this time. It's the Baptist doctrine. It is the very gospel of John the Baptist that Jesus continued on to train his apostles with. Now there were in the church, that was at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas, Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manan, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. It says, as they ministered to the Lord, we're talking about the church, the church here, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, said to who? To the church. Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have what? I have called them, all right? It's not a choosing, it's a calling. And when they had fasted the church and prayed the church and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So it's not where you went, it's where you're sent. It is not a choosing, it is a calling. And it starts with local churches, Jesus being the first pastor, shepherd of the sheep. Didn't he say that after he was resurrected? So send I you. Doesn't, didn't he say that? Amen. It's always been the local church sending out the gospel. It's not an individual thing. But we have a lot of charlatans that, and uh, I've had even Christian preachers tell me that Balaam was a man of God. Duh. He's so condemned and, and the Jews actually killed him in the book of uh, Joshua, wasn't it? We studied because he was a false prophet. But he was he was his own man. He was not sent out by Moses or anybody else. And the uh, so they sent them away. So they being sent, 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 sent forth by the Holy Ghost through the church, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They had John Mark here to their minister. Now Acts 15 verse 22 is a good verse for that because they're sending them back to the church Paul established and Barnabas established. 
And Paul and Barnabas were now missionaries out of that church. I don't know who the pastor of the Antioch church is at this time. Could have been one of those guys in that list of names. But then they're sending them back to Antioch to agree with them that salvation is open to the Gentiles, not just a Jewish thing. Because remember, none of them had a Bible like we do. That was 2,000 years ago, we call the primitive church. Local, visible, primitive church. 22 says, Then pleased that the apostles and the elders with who? Come on. The whole church. This was not just a denominational thing. This wasn't a preacher's fellowship. This wasn't a gospel union or some other parachurch organization. This was the local church that we just read about, chapter 13. And please the apostles and the elders with the whole church to send chosen men. See, you're chosen, you're called, and you're sent by a local church. The whole church to send chosen men of their what? Mission board. No, of their own company. That's why we send missionaries out of our local church, not through a mission agency or denomination. Those came after the Reformation back in 1500 when Martin Luther defected as a priest and other guys started the Protestant Reformation. That's where all this extra junk came from. It just used to be the Lord Jesus and the local church, but not anymore. So it says the whole church, they sent them, chosen men of their own company, the Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. So we have here Paul is allowed, as we go back to Thessalonians, he is allowed. Barnabas actually was the first church sent missionary. If you go back and study that in chapter 12, it says now Barnabas was sent by the church of Jerusalem. And he went, and he's the one who called Paul over to Antioch, because Paul was over there. Uh, Paul of, uh, what was his town? Tarsus. Tarsus, right? Wherever he spent his three years there in Arabia. So uh, anyway, so we go back here to Thessalonians, and we pick up here. So Paul's allowance, so his permission granted is what he's talking about, verse 4. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak. Now, if anybody should not have been allowed to preach the gospel, it should have been Paul. But he said, "What, Lord, what will I have me to do? And if God said, go, go uh, jump in the lake and call me uh, in two years, he told him immediately he needed him. Because he drew so much attention, he could get, he certainly could get an ear if he was saved. So it says, this gospel he was entrusted to, put in trust, and that's why it's so, you better be, you better know the New Testament. Because we've been put in, entrusted with the truth of Jesus Christ. A lot of preachers will say, well, I'll tell you what I believe. I'll tell you what I believe. We don't, we don't want to hear that. We want to hear what God believes. Amen. We have this all over the radios, all over the TV, in, in churches, just to get attention. But we've been trusted with the gospel, and even so we speak. Not as pleasing men, so we see some things here. So we preach not to please men, but to please God. And then he goes on, which trieth our hearts. So God holds the preachers accountable for what they speak, who trieth our hearts. He puts us to the test. Sometimes, and I know Brother Gray knows this and other preachers that have been in the ministry, when you have a good Sunday, you might say, you can just get ready for a bad Monday. You know how Mondays can go, Glendon? Or someone, well, the devil, he, he don't like what you did on Sunday. He doesn't like people who got right with the Lord or got saved or grew in the Lord. So we go through these trials after we preach the gospel, but he says God tries our hearts over what we say to his, they're his people. They're not 
the preacher's people, they're, they're servants uh, of the Most High God. For neither at any time use we flattering words. Well, I wonder if that's changed. It seems like all I hear on the radio is flattering words. There's one person in particular that really knows how to do that. Uh, I can't remember what his name is. It's a Bible name, Joel or something. Uh, well, you and you in, in, in cell phone land, you probably know what I'm saying here. But it says, for neither at any time use we flattering words. He said this in Corinthians also. He, they did not butter people up and try to uh, make them smile and, and lead them in a false salvation. Neither at any time use we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. We didn't go there to get something. We went there to give something. God is witness. So God tries our hearts, and God is a witness to how we present the gospel. That we're allowed, what a privilege it is to all of us to be able to, to work for Jesus Christ. We can knock doors and leave gospel tracts and talk to people in the public place. But God is our witness. We're not to do this uh, for covetousness. It says, nor of men sought we glory. So we preach the gospel not trying to gain attention and say, how did I do how am I doing? How am I doing? Because we see here, looking for uh, affirmation and pat on the back. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you. We, where we've been, we didn't do that. Now that we're here, we're not doing that. Nor yet of others. So if we leave here and we go, we're not going to be flattering people. We've been down the road in honesty. We're here in honesty. We'll go there in honesty as well when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. Now he's talking about being burdensome, obligating them to support them with their meager funds, because they're all under persecution, by the way. So now we have Paul's entrance that we talked about, verses 1 to 3. And now we have Paul's allowance. He's allowed to, to, a great privilege to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ from the calling and the choosing of God and the sending of the local independent Baptist church. Oh yeah, they were all independent because there was no funny business going on until at least 300, 100, 300, 600 A.D. when universalism came in and ruined the, the gospel of Christ and brought in works. In the, in the first century to the to 600s, and then it really turned into Catholicism after that. So now, lastly, look at Paul's example, verse 7 to 10. We've seen Paul's entrance, Paul's allowance, we call it, and now his example. So he said that we came like this, we acted like that, and here here's the example. He tells them the example that he and his uh, his his preachers brought to them. So it says here in verse 7 to 10, but we were what? Gentle. Gentle. There's, there's, there's an example. All of us can pick, um, this is a pretty good sized list here. I think, well, I have many words written down here. So we have an example to set each Christian. We're, we were gentle among you. Not arguing and fighting and bickering like today's Christianity. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse does what? Cherish. cherish. It's the word chair or cherish. It's a Latin term here and uh, in Greek term. It means to highly regard, to cherish. People that love their kids cherish their kids. And as a nurse cherisheth her children, highly regard or highly value. So they were gentle and they... They saw the value of these souls and took, took that. Uh, so being affectionately, so there's another thing, having an affection, having a tender tenderness, we call it. So being affectionately desirous of you. So they really wanted, they really wanted to reach these people for Christ. They really wanted to bring them out of heathenism and paganism and all the other things floating around, the doctrines. It says, we were willing to have, uh, excuse me, being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, so they wanted to leave their knowledge with them, 
and leave the gospel with him. It says, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls. They got personally involved with their with their uh, Thessalonian people. So they, we gave them the gospel, but also our own souls. They, they poured out their life for these people. Because you were dear unto us. So in a nice, there's a lot of churches where people sit on the, especially the larger churches, they sit in different parts of that big auditorium so they won't be close to other Christians they don't like. I don't hear any amens out there. Okay, amen. I'm glad the auditorium is not that big that people can escape each other. I've had people say, well, we don't want to go to a smaller church because then everybody will know our business. Well, that's not necessarily true. But here, you were dear to us. They wanted to get to know them. They wanted to give them the gospel. They wanted to give them an example of what Christ can do in a person's life who's born again. Especially Paul, Saul. Can't you imagine they heard about his reputation? Verse 9 says, For ye remember, brethren, our, what is it? Hard work, our labor, so, and travail. Now, they, if this is the first letter, and these are the first people they're dealing with, they're not there to burden them, to give them their, 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 their own money, the Thessalonians' money. Paul says, we, we found the town, we could support ourselves by doing different jobs and, and taking care of ourselves. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail. So we have uh, these guys laboring. Now, Paul, he was a, a government official. He was a military fellow. He, he was a Jewish leader. And what else did he do? He had a sewing needle, didn't he? Tent maker, we could say a home builder today. For labored and brethren, we labored and travailed. For laboring night and day. That means day shift, that means night shift, whatever, whatever it took to stay there and, and stay alive. For laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. In other words, he's proving we didn't come here with covetous motives. We, we're not sly, we're not conniving, we're not deceitful, we're not trying to get a following. We just want to impart something to you and then move on. So we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you, what? The gospel of God. So we have here verse 10 as we get ready to finish. So they were gentle, they were caring, they uh, cherished those people, they highly valued, valued those people, they were affectionate, they were sharing people, sacrificial people, uh, they labored and they hurt while they were doing it. They uh, went, uh, showed endurance and they showed sensitivity to the needs of those people. And then verse 10 closes out here. And he says, uh, Ye are witnesses, and God also, how, what's the next word? Holy. Holy. That's kind of a strange word, isn't it? But they, they set a holy example. They were there for one reason, to bring the gospel of God. Your witnesses, an example here, and God also, how holily and justly, meaning fairly, justly and unblameably, very careful in their public life, so they would not, they would live above reproach and blame, and unblameably, we behaved ourselves among you that believe. So they were behaving them. You know, my mom used to say, you better behave yourself. Anybody have a mom or dad like that? You better behave yourself. Well, what, what are you going to do about it? You, know, well, you, didn't, tell, you didn't tell my family that. Because <laughs> they'd probably be on here soon. You said, well, uh, you want to get two syllables out for the year on the floor now. <laughs> tell you something. Yeah, they should have gone to jail, but... God didn't allow that. They allowed God. God allowed them to beat me when I needed. I didn't really get many spankings. My brother Joe did, because he was older than me, and, and he he was doing he was doing bad before I learned how to do it. Boy, he, he would he looked like a tennis ball 
bounce around the room when my mother get hold of him. I said, I better not do what Joe did. I'll be all right. Your witnesses how God also, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved, be, behaved ourselves among you that believe. So we've seen Paul's entrance uh, opening to them. We've seen he was allowed of God to, and the great privilege to be called and chosen and sent and as representative of the church Jesus built. And then he gives an example and you know, we might have a hard time living up to this list uh, of examples. Are we gentle, caring? Are we affectionate? Are we sharing? Are we sacrificial? Are we laboring? And uh, I like to work, okay? I do. Sometimes I, I need to just get away from problems of ministry. I didn't mind, I mean, I, I don't want to fall off the roof. But, so, you know, we need to work out. This whole body will fall apart. You'll die young if you don't put it, if you don't labor, right? Hello, you there? And so you got to do something to keep, keep moving, keep healthy. But he said, we labored and we hurt because of it. We've endured. We're sensitive to your needs. We lived a holy life, a fair life, a careful behavior life in public. So these are really good things to, to emulate or copy that the apostles did. It wouldn't hurt any, any of us to go the second mile, would it? So Jesus said, if anybody asks you to go one mile, what do you do? Go twain, which means go two miles. So Lord, we thank you for the time in chapter two. I was getting ready to finish it next week. We thank you for sending people our way with the gospel. Thank you for the preachers that you allowed into our lives. We ask you now to help us to live this example life that he talks about with him and the boys. And thank you for the plan of salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. All right, let's take our prayer sheets.